Each paper will have 15 minutes of presentation, no discussant, and then at the end, we will have 45 minutes in total for Q&A. Um, when each pre presentation has two minutes left, you will hear a ringtone from me uh, like this. I hope you can hear it. And uh, after your time is up, you will hear that same tone again. So the second time when you hear that sound, it means your time is up. Participants can ask questions uh, through the Q&A box, which uh, presentation uh, presenters can address at, at any time. Or um, I think after we get to the Q&A section, people will also be able to use the raise hand function. And finally, um, we would like to remind you that when you get an email with the AFA Work Climate Survey, please fill out that survey. And without further ado, uh, we will start with the first paper Pandemics, Vaccines, and Corporate Earnings, and Harrison will present. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Yurab, for uh, putting together this special session. It looks terrific. Uh, this paper is joint with uh, Jeff Kubik, Meng Wang, uh, Xiao Xu, and, and Jin Qingyang. Uh, we've, we've updated, sorry, we were not able to put an updated version of the paper on the AFA site, but you can get it off of the SSRN. Um, so let me start with sort of what, what, what the paper is about. Um, if you look at, uh, if you read sort of the typical textbook uh, epidemiology uh, strategy for dealing with the pandemic, you know, it'll tell you that you have to quickly implement a vaccine. Uh, if you can't, in the interim, you, you basically have to incur a lot of costly mitigation such as quarantines and whatnot, okay? So that the expected damage, whether it's to uh, the health of the population or the wealth of the economy, you know, essentially uh, is going to be a function of these, 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 these two determinants. Uh, if you look at uh, the recent explosion of papers uh, by economists on uh, COVID-19 optimi optimal mitigation models, uh, you, you have a very similar uh, damage function, if you will. Uh, whether you think about models of social distancing, lockdowns, or more targeted interventions. So typically in these models, uh, you could have an externality framework where the social planner is thinking about optimal mitigation strategies, but always anticipating the arrival of the vaccine. Or you could even have it with firms uh, that are operating in competitive markets. Uh, they're also basically uh, trying to do the same thing. So, so that when the vaccine arrives, then uh, mitigation stops. So the cost of mitigation stops, and then there should be a jump in earnings. Okay. So. You know, surprisingly, um, it's been very challenging uh, to estimate uh, a damage function. Um, and, and there's a number of reasons for this, I guess. So one is, is that these damage functions, if you look at the models, are, are going to involve a number of parameters. Second, nonlinearity is actually pretty important. It's fundamental uh, in, 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 in a lot of these models. So, so particularly, there's a lot of nonlinearity in how damage varies with uh, the vaccine arrival rate. And we all know that estimating nonlinear models is, is trickier than, than linear ones uh, because you're going to need much more timely uh, and higher frequency data uh, uh, to get any type of precision uh, when it comes to estimating these damages. Okay. So what we try to do uh, in the paper uh, is, is to give sort of an approach to, to, to address these challenges. Uh, first, we're going to propose uh, probably the most parsimonious model possible for, 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 for modeling damage from, from, from the arrival of pandemic to the economy. Uh, it's gonna be a continuous time regime switching model for earnings where uh, the vaccine uh, or it could be any other therapeutic intervention um, is gonna arrive following some Poisson process time. Uh, the earnings otherwise are, are geometric Brownian motion absent these jumps. So the first jump is when the vaccine, uh, when the pandemic arrives and of course, the second jump is when the vaccine arrives uh, to, to basically bring the economy back to normal. So what's nice about this regime switching model, which is very widely used you know, in, in, in finance, of course, is we can derive a very tractable nonlinear damage function. Uh, it's gonna be a function of only three parameters, uh, a vaccine arrival rate, lambda, a jump in earnings, n, and then the ratio of the pandemic to the non-pandemic growth rates of earnings which we'll call just G over G hat. We're gonna then estimate uh, this, 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 this function using industry level uh, consensus security earnings forecast revisions. 
right? So, so these, these analysts are making projections about immediately following the arrival of COVID, but what the path of earnings will be going out to at least five years. So, and they update these forecasts every month. So that's gonna allow us essentially to observe right, at least what one subset of what we think of as fairly incentivized uh, uh, professionals are thinking about the damage, okay? What's also nice about the model is there's a very natural set of exclusion restrictions that you can place on forecast rationality, uh, which I'll discuss later, that allows us then to estimate the model uh, using nonlinear least squares. Okay, so this is about sort of as good as it gets, I guess, in terms of tractability and, and, and estimation. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about a way to extend in the framework to account for some time varying vaccine arrival rates. So the main findings are, so if you look at uh, the first set of forecasts that fully incorporated information about COVID, that would be basically around mid-May 2020, right? Uh, we estimate a, a very severe negative jump in earnings levels with the arrival of COVID in excess of 50%. There's definitely lower growth rates in the pandemic regime. That is, analysts do not expect any, in fact, negative growth rates during the duration of a pandemic absent the vaccine. And then the vaccine they're expecting to arrive in 0.74 years, okay? If you run likelihood ratio tests, you can reject the constrained model that lambda is zero. So lambda is the arrival rate. Zero basically means there'll never be a vaccine or the vaccine will be out like 10 years from now. And you can also reject the constrained model where there's no damage to growth rates. That is G over G hat is one, okay? Uh, you're gonna get very similar estimates when you look at these highly levered, high face-to-face -face industries that there have been a number of papers uh, uh, documenting, right, i.e. airlines or whatnot, uh, the model is surprisingly robust to different subsectors uh, uh, of the economy. Uh, you can also run a placebo sample and you can basically get exactly the lambda zero in these non-COVID periods and G over G hat is pretty close to one. Uh, and then in the August 20 forecast, 2020 forecast, which is the last set of revisions we have available to academics, the vaccine arrival rate is uh, expected uh, is, is 0.34 years, which puts us roughly right around January, February, as when analysts uh, were thinking in August, the economy would get back to normal. All right, so here's, here's the model. So in, 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 in the interest of time, I'll just show a couple of pictures and then basically the main estimation uh, of regression. So this is, uh, the blue line is, is earnings. It's following a geometric ground motion, okay? And then this, uh, you, you can kind of see the color uh, where my arrow is, that's sort of the pre-pandemic growth rate or the non-pandemic growth rate of earnings, okay? Now COVID arrives basically uh, at the green dot, right, to the red dot, that's gonna be the, the arrival of COVID, that, that's time zero, okay, that's the event date. And there's gonna be a big jump in earnings, which in the models reflect essentially uh, because the vaccine cannot be implemented as at, in, you know, in an infinite amount of time, the vaccine is not here. Uh, you basically need to do very costly mitigation, social distancing, shutting down businesses, et cetera. Okay, so there's gonna be kind of this level shift in earnings. In this path, we've basically uh, uh, programmed in that uh, the, the, the vaccine is expected to arrive at around one year. So you'll see this jump here right, on this particular path a little bit after one year. Okay, and when earnings pop back up uh, is when basically the vaccine has arrived and the costly mitigation no longer needs to be paid. Okay, so this little red line here is the uh, pandemic growth rate, which you know, here we've programmed it to be sort of mild, but in the data actually is quite severe as we'll, 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 we'll document. And kind of the key, key, key sort of idea of, of the estimation of the damage function, of course, is that, you know, we have this red dot, which you can think of as the analyst forecast, right? Starting at time zero of what they think the path of earnings will be going out to five years, right? And the point is that, you know, if they think if people, if the analysts are making these revisions and they think a vaccine is coming, okay, their forecast actually will mostly be damaged in the short term, right? Uh, because, you know, it's unlikely that a vaccine can come instantly, but uh, they'll actually have a very steep, right? There won't be much damage, you know, to the extent that the vaccine arrives within a year, there won't be very steep damage, basically. There won't be much revisions uh, for further out forecasts. That is essentially, uh, Vaccines make the COVID shock uh, transient as opposed to permanent, right? 
And you, know, you can pick up uh, whether or not the shock of COVID is permanent or transient uh, based on essentially the term structure of forecast revisions. Okay. All right, so here's the formula. So tau is gonna be some stochastic arrival rate of the vaccine. T, uh, you're already in the pandemic regime. Here, we're looking at essentially the analyst earnings uh, a forecast out to time S, uh, basically scaled by YT. So this is a growth rate. So what does the formula say? The formula says, well, look, you know, the first piece is essentially integrating over all the possible arrival times of the vaccine, okay? And then basically calculating exactly the expected damage uh, uh, conditioning on these arrival times. And then the second piece is uh, the vaccine never arrives. Okay, within this period of T to S, all right? Uh, so, so then we're gonna basically be able to get a kind of a nice formula. There's really a function of just three parameters, lambda, that's the vaccine arrival rate, uh, G hat, G hat will be data that we already know because we know what the business as usual growth rates are. And then basically G, which is essentially gonna be the growth rate during uh, the pandemic, right? Okay, and then the other uh, 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 independent variable, of course, is S minus T, which is the horizon of the forecast. All right, for the estimation, we're going to work with industry level observations, which we denote by J, and then the time is, is, is monthly is T. So what this damage function suggests is the following uh, regression that relates a uh, consensus forecast, which will denote by FTJS, to two independent variables of uh, the forecast horizon, S minus T, and then uh, the, the, the non-pandemic growth rate of earnings, G hat. Okay, and we're gonna assume, and so that this is really kind of the key is that of course, the analyst consensus forecasts are going to be a noisy uh, uh, a version of the actual expectations, okay? So that's gonna give us then the natural error term with which we can run a regression. So uh, we're gonna run everything in logs so that the, the, the natural then uh, uh, error, it will be the log of the forecast, the forecast bias, if you will, of the analyst uh, for a horizon S at time T and the forecast bias for the analyst right before the pandemic at time S, to time S. So the exclusion restriction then will be the expectation of the log difference of these forecast biases condition on S minus T and G hat uh, J is equal to zero, okay? If this is true, you can estimate this with nonlinear least squares and pick up consistent estimates. So let's think a little bit about what this exclusion restriction means. So first, of course, if the forecasts are rational, use are gonna be white noise. So obviously this condition will hold, right? So if analysts are, are fairly rational about making these forecasts, we're good to go with estimating the damage function using uh, 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 not in least squares. So we don't need any instruments or anything like that, okay? Now, just because there's bias, obviously there's a large literature on analyst forecast bias, right? For a number of different reasons. That doesn't necessarily invalidate the estimation either, right? It's really that the ratio of these biases, right? The net difference of these biases have to basically be correlated with the regressors, okay? And, you know, we, in the paper, we talk about a number of different scenarios, which I'm not gonna have time to go through. Uh, but, but we think this is sort of a plausible identification uh, uh, assumption. Now, also what's interesting about COVID, of course, is that, you know, obviously if the analysts are super biased with their forecasts, we'll never get a vaccine, right? So one version is they think a vaccine will come immediately. And of course the vaccine just doesn't come, right? So it's kind of an interesting case where we can check a little bit, right? The plausibility uh, of, 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 of the, uh, 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 identification restriction. And I think there's some earlier work by Landy and Fesmar to show that the forecasts themselves, at least when correlated with stock prices, seem to be well calibrated, okay? All right, so nonlinearity. The function is inherently nonlinear in all of the arguments, but in particular, it's nonlinear in lambda, right? So this is a comparative static of what the damage function is gonna look like as you vary lambda, right? So this is the revision down to time zero. So here we've kind of plotted a minus 40% revision in earnings. Now, if the vaccine basically is here already, right, that's the lambda, uh, sorry, if, if the vaccine is, is very uh, far away, that's a lambda close to zero, you know, you're gonna get uh, this, this, this type of damage function, right? The, the revisions will be very low for some long period of time. 
Whereas if you have a high lambda, right, you're going to basically pick up mostly revisions in the short term and hardly any major revisions in the long term. Uh, that's going to be given by this dotted line. And uh, the, 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 this, this sort of pinkish line here is as if the, back, as if the pandemic never, never came. This is kind of a business as usual type of growth rate. Okay. This is what the data looks like, right? This is kind of what we're gonna be estimating on. So you'll see in the data uh, in mid-May of 2020, just really massive revisions to FY1 forecast. You know, the mean is like minus, uh, is, is, is minus 54% with a massive standard deviation uh, of 0.84. But if you look at FY2, that's going to be denoted by the uh, red dots here. It's pretty getting close to zero revisions, right? So this is essentially this nonlinearity that we think identifies, uh, 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 that really picks up the quintessentialness of the damage function associated with these, these, these epidemic type of models um, uh, involving vaccines. And if you go further out, you'll see basically what we're going to try to argue is that this data, right, is going to suggest a function that involves much more uh, curvature in terms of these, these, these revisions. Okay. All right, this is what the estimates look like. So lambda is 1.354. This is one, column one is the unconstrained model uh, with the three parameters. Uh, so lambda is a 1.354, that's about a 0.74. One over lambda is the expected arrival time. So that's about 0.74 years. This is made in mid, mid May. So that would basically be putting us right around uh, January, February, March, uh, type of scenario. G over G hat is minus 1.2. So there's a really severe uh, damage to growth rates. This is consistent with some of the work uh, that, that Cogen and others have done using these dividend futures. And then uh, N, which is the jump parameter, is pretty massive. We're getting actually uh, the model starts at a minus 80% jump. Part of the reason for that is we're doing equal weighted nonlinear least squares. So it's going to basically pick up, it's going to want to fit. Uh, some of these high leverage industries that were massively damaged uh, uh, during, during this uh, initial period. If you run two, which is the constrained model, right? So here's kind of the intuition. If you basically pretend that lambda is zero, what you're gonna pick up actually is you're gonna pick up a positive growth rate, right? It's gonna look as if the economy is quite okay, you know? All right, it's gonna be a 0.85, it's not too bad. And then there's gonna be a little bit of a jump. It looks like kind of, you know, maybe a bad year for earnings, uh, but nothing really spectacular or historic. And then in three, you could also uh, set the growth rate to be one. So that is, there's no damage in growth rate. And then you can see that uh, you're going to get also very biased uh, 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 estimates as well. So we can kind of do that basically a likelihood ratio test to compare model one, which is the unconstrained model against two and against or, or against three. So this is what the likelihood ratio, you can definitely, obviously you can see that in the data, there's behind the data here in two, in, in three dimensions. Uh, this is the, this is the function. Uh, on, on one axis is going to be basically the uh, pre-pandemic industry growth rates. The other is basically forecast horizon, right? That's the data that we're fitting using nonlinear least squares. And you can see the data has a lot of curvature associated with the forecast horizon and also across uh, industries. So it turns out really, you know, the industries that were very damaged are also pretty low growth rate industries to begin with. Uh, you know, that's the kind of the, the summary, if you will, of a lot of the thing. So we think the model makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, if you fit, if you pretend to have the zero, you get this weird fit. You know, basically, it's like a line, right? It doesn't kind of fit any of the data. And similarly, uh, you can also reject that there was no damage to growth rates as well, right? Uh, you can you definitely see basically a lot of damage to growth rates. Uh, you can estimate exactly the same thing in a high face to face sample. Uh, you know, so you're going to get very similar lambdas. Uh, the, there's, there's a little more damage uh, to the growth rates, but it's not statistically different uh, using these nonlinear models. So, so typically with nonlinear models, dealing with these uh, uh, interaction effects could be very tricky. So we did something very simple just to compare the point estimates. Right? So we feel Let's pretty good up, about the damage you, function. Thanks, Jan. Uh, and then um, I'm not gonna go into this part. It's gonna be, you can look at the paper. You can also extend the framework to incorporate new forecasts. So you can start updating basically as analysts give more forecasts, you can estimate, you can update the damage function. So a natural way then basically is the, the, the uh, um, the, uh, uh, to, have a, to have a time varying vaccine arrival rate interpretation uh, uh, to, 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 to picking up how to update these forecasts. And uh, we, did, we did an estimation uh, and you know, June and July, uh, vaccine arrival rates were very similar to May, but definitely in August, uh, there was a statistically significant pickup in terms of what analysts thought 
of the vaccine, when the analysts thought the vaccine would be coming. So basically in, in August, you're picking up a 2.88, which means the standing in August, this is the Poisson model. Uh, they're basically thinking now uh, the vaccine arrival rate is about uh, 0.35 years, okay? Which puts us at exactly uh, uh, around now. All right, I think I have to I'm wrap up early. Uh, I'm gonna give my conclusion with a video that my, can you guys see the video? So. So hopefully the vaccine works. We all get back to normal. Happy New Year. Thanks, Harrison. The second paper is Corporate Flexibility in a Time of Crisis, and John is going to present. All right, so uh, thanks for organizing the session, John, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. I've been looking forward to it. So just to start off, uh, well, I'm going to present Corporate Flexibility in a, type of, in a Time of Crisis. And just to give some motivation, CFOs, the key financial decision makers at, at companies, have long indicated that flexibility, the ability to adapt your business in response to changing conditions, is one of the most important aspects of, of running a company su successfully. And despite this, you know, there's been very little research up to now in corporate finance that studies corporate flexibility as a multi-dimensional object. So this is going to form the basis for our paper. We're going to break corporate flexibility into different dimensions and see which of these is driving real decisions, specifically real decisions on employment and investment. First dimension we're gonna focus on is financial flexibility. And we think this is something that's pretty well understood. It, it's an important part of our paper, but I'm not gonna focus on it too much today. But oper operational flexibility, this ability to adapt your operations in response to changing conditions is, is something that's been less studied in the past and we think is a little harder to study because it's not really been a something that firms have had to activate in the past. And within operational flexibility, we're thinking about workplace flexibility, which is the ability to deploy labor remotely or move to a remote working environment, and investment flexibility, which is the ability to modify the timing of your investment projects. So in this paper, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use COVID-19 as a shock to observe how firms use flexibility, in particular, with a particular focus on operational flexibility and see how they, they, they adapt their plans and manage through a crisis. Okay, so just a little bit, uh, a note on our research design. Uh, the backbone of our paper is the quarterly CFO survey run by Duke, uh, of which the March 2020 survey overlaps pretty well with the onset of COVID. If you remember, COVID kind of hit in mid-March, which sits directly in the middle of this survey period. What this gives us is, is kind of a continuous set of CFO responses about firm plans as the, we saw the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're gonna match this to measures of corporate flexibility and see which of these drive uh, real decisions kind of at the onset of the crisis. We then conducted a couple of follow-on surveys, June, September, and December CFO surveys, where we, we asked CFOs to just about what they think about the long-term effects to discern uh, the role of flexibility as kind of the pandemic continues and as we exit the pandemic as well. So just kind of, we have a, a two-tiered research design just to clarify when the crisis began at the pandemic onset and how firms are dealing with things as the pandemic continues and as we move into maybe a post-pandemic world. Okay, quick note on findings. You know, pandemic onset back in March, how firms are using flexibility to adapt. Workplace flexibility, this ability to deploy labor remotely is a key determinant of employment. Uh, investment flexibility, this ability to modify the timing of investment. We find that this has a key conditional impact on, invest, on investment itself and uh, the kind of the conditioning variable or the interacting variable here is workplace flexibility. And for pand pand pandemic continuation and long-term effects, we wanna know how flexibility shapes corporate decisions going forward. Well, our findings suggest that workplace flexibility is in, in some way changing the nature of investment and that firms with workplace flexibility are perhaps moving away from tr traditional capital expenditures and in, in structures and equipment. And we also have some interesting results, uh, you know, in automation in that, you know, firms with that lack, low, that lack workplace flexibility are more likely to introduce labor reducing automation. And furthermore, these same firms with low workplace flexibility this automation is more likely to affect low-skill workers. 
Okay. And then uh, just to kind of unify, bring in the unifying theme here, you know, as you might have guessed, just the nature of the shock of COVID-19, it really hit the nature of the workplace. Uh, we find that kind of workplace flexibility is the, the binding margin within corporate flexibility in a pandemic or in COVID-19. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through how we're, we're measuring these, these different dimensions of corporate flexibility. So financial flexibility, this is directly from the CFO. It's uh, the CFO's self-assessed measure of uh, the level of his or her firm's financial flexibility. What it's really covering is, is access to financing, be it internal financing or ext external financing. Workplace flexibility. We're taking this from the American Time Use Survey, which surveys the distribution of workers across the United States. And it, it asks two, two, key, two key questions. First question is, can the worker remote work, work remotely? And the second question, do they actually do their job uh, remotely as well? So what is this capturing? This is capturing that a firm can and does do remote work, uh, or kind of as I mentioned it before, this ability to, to move to a remote working environment. And this last measure, uh, investment flexibility, this is kind of unique to the, the CFO survey. It's coming from a previous edition of the survey, but- um, Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Some participants um, say that the slides don't work for them. It, it is working for me. Um, can other panelists weigh in if the slides don't work? They're working or? Anyone had trouble seeing the slides? Okay, um, so then we'll continue. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, back to uh, investment flexibility. Um, we asked CFOs about uh, flexibility with respect to the speed of completion of their investment projects. So this measure is kind of directly related to the timing or time to completion of investment. It's, and it's capturing that firms can easily move up or delay investment projects. Okay, so just to kind of bring these, these flexibility measures, I wanna, before I get into results, just explain some of our predictions about how these things influence employment and investment. Financial flexibility, we expect this to lead to higher employment and higher capital spending, okay? Uh, workplace flexibility, we expect this to have a, a key direct uh, effect on employment. And investment flexibility, we think it has a, a conditional impact on investment. And, what I mean by conditional here is that it, its use depends on whether the firm is facing adverse or favorable conditions. You think about what the pandemic has been or COVID-19, you know, this ability to move to a remote working environment is, is kind of a key determinant of, the, of your condition of whether you're facing adverse versus favorable conditions. And uh, this is gonna interact with investment flexibility in an interesting way. And I'll, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a slide or two. Okay, so just to get into our results. So what is this table? The de dependent variables here are either the CFO's growth rate forecast of employment or capital spending. So our, the dependent variables are our firm plans for employment and investment. And there's kind of two key things to take away from this table. Number one, as I kind of predict, we predicted, workplace flexibility is a key determinant of employment in that workplace flexibility leads to higher employment. And number two, I spoke about this conditional impact of investment flexibility, this ability to modify the timing of your investment. Well, it might look like it, it doesn't have an effect on investment, but this is actually hiding that, you know, some firms with investment flexibility are increasing investment and some firms are de decreasing investment. I'll get into that in a second. Last thing from this slide, just that, uh, you know, don't want to forget about financial flexibility. It remains a very important determinant of, of firm plans. And this is consistent with research from the uh, 2008 crisis. Okay. So just a little more on this conditional impact of investment flexibility. I mentioned it, it, its use depends on whether you, you face adverse or favorable conditions. Workplace flexibility is the determinant of adverse versus favorable in a pandemic. Just gonna walk through this, this mechanism here in this table, focusing first on firms with low investment flexibility. So these are the types of firms that do not have the ability to modify the timing or time to completion of their investment. Think about what low investment flexibility is. It's really just a form of investment rigidity. So we imagine that these firms, irrespective of the, the conditions that they face, uh, are kind of locked into their investment in that their investment is relatively similar to what it would be if COVID-19 had not happened. Moving on to firms with investment flexibility, you know, let's think about, you know, a firm with investment flexibility, um, they, they can easily modify the timing of their investment. Let's say they, they face adverse conditions or, you know, in a pandemic, they have low workplace flexibility. This firm might say, okay, let's just, cut back on our investment or reduce our investment permanently and, and to let, let's see until uh, the, the effects of these, this pandemic lessens. So what we have here is that low workplace flexibility 
firms, investment flexibility leads to a reduction in investment. And for firms with high workplace flexibility, it's it's kind of the exact opposite story. They they you know, they're, they're facing a relatively favorable set of conditions because they have this ability to transfer to a remote working environment. They're gonna use this investment flexibility to adapt their workplace to, to take advantage of this workplace flexibility. So how are we gonna test this, this, this conditional relationship? We're just gonna interact our two measures of, of, in, of flexibility of investment and workplace flexibility. So we here see here that the, the interactive coefficient is, is, has a large magnitude and is quite significant just to clarify you know, how the, the role of investment flexibility in, in this table. If we think about a firm that has very low or zero workplace flexibility, they totally lack the ability to, to deploy labor remotely. Investment flexibility has a negative effect on investment. And we think about firms at the other side of workplace flexibility, you know, with perfect workplace flexibility, investment flexibility for these firms lead, leads to an increase in investment. And then just kind of a, a convenient thing we can do is we wanted to check if, if plans you know, are converting into realizations. So we went to CompuStat 2020Q data and uh, 2020Q2 data and got CapEx growth realizations and just run very similar specifications. And we see that the interpretation magnitudes in, in CompuStat are very similar. So we're seeing plans convert into real, real, realizations and we also kind of have confirmation of our results from a different data set. Okay, so just the key takeaways, I've been speaking about the role of flexibility at the onset of the pandemic. Workplace flexibility is a key determinant of employment. Of employment, uh, We have some results from subsequent surveys that I won't talk about today, but it's gonna remain, a, it remains a, a, a determinant of employment until at least the end of 2021. So these, these effects are, are long-term. Uh, investment flexibility has this kind of conditional uh, effect on investment via its interaction with workplace flexibility in that low workplace flexibility leads to investment flexibility reducing investment and the, the opposite situation for high workplace flexibility. And the key unifying theme here to bring it back again is that workplace flexibility is the important dimension, the binding uh, dimension of, of corporate flexibility in a pandemic. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you in the last few minutes, a few results from our subsequent surveys and uh, basically what the CFOs think about the, the pandemic continuation, how long-term the effects will be. So in our September survey, we asked, CFOs, how long they think the, the negative impact of COVID-19 is going to affect employment and capital spending, and how long they think uh, the, the level of remote work will be higher than it, it was before pre-COVID. So just to walk through this figure, here I'm focusing on firms that saw no change to their levels of employment or capital spending or saw a decrease. And just the takeaway from these two panels is that most firms think, or most CFOs think that employment will return relatively quickly by the end of 2021. Similar for capital spending, although it tilts a little later for capital spending in terms of so a little few more firms think it's unlikely to return. So just the takeaway here is that uh, these effects on employment and capital spending are relatively short lived. In terms of uh, remote work, I hear that you know for firms that saw an increase or no change in their level of remote work, 30% of these firms think that this increase is, is, unlikely, is, is, is unlikely to revert and that the, the, the effects of, of COVID-19 on remote work are, are permanent. Okay, so just to kind of explore the effects of workplace flexibility on the, this, the time to return of these variables, I'm just gonna take these, these three responses and order them and, and run a few ordered logic regressions. So the coefficients here are, are odds ratios in that. If a coefficient is less than one, it means that the CFO thinks the variable is likely to return earlier. So just three takeaways from this table. Workplace flexibility is associated with a, a faster employment recovery. It's, it's also associated with a, a relatively slower return to uh, capital spending. And uh, finally, as you might expect, uh, it's associated with uh, more permanent or longer term effects on the level of remote work. Okay, so up to this point, I've showed you kind of the effect of COVID-19 on, on traditional firm decisions such as employment and, and investment and, and the role that the flexibility plays both kind of at the onset and the continuation. You know, we think a very relevant margin that, that, that companies will start to use as they, they move forward is in the introduction of automation and specifically labor reducing automation. So, so we, you know, we ask them directly what they think about this. So in our December survey, we, we asked firms simply do you plan on introducing labor reducing automation since the onset of COVID? 40% of firms say that they do. We do a simple split by of large versus small. 60% uh, of large firms 
say that they're they're planning on introducing automation and uh, labor reducing automation specifically. And because the CFO survey sample tilts a little smaller, if we were to extrapolate these results to the wide population of US firms, it seems that you know, labor reducing automation is a very relevant and prevalent margin since the onset of COVID. Okay, so just to kind of talk about, again, we also asked uh, CFOs about what, which parts of the skill distribution will be affected by labor reducing automation. So just take away from this set of bars here is that low skill workers are much more likely to be affected by automation than high skill. So 50% of firms say that automation is solely going to affect low skill workers. 80% say it's going to affect low skill. There will be some effect on high skill in this orange bar here. If I do a split on workplace flexibility, we see a pretty interesting tilt towards low skill workers being affected at low workplace flexibility firms. So this, this we have a kind of an increase in this blue bar, blue bar here and that solely low skill workers will be affected. To just tie these, past, these last two questions into workplace flexibility, I'm gonna take the responses and again, run some logit or ordered logit regressions. Coefficients are again, odd, odds ratios, but just to kind of spell out the results, the two results in this table is number one, work, low workplace flexibility, low workplace flexibility uh, specifically leads to a higher propensity to introduce labor reducing automation. And secondly, low workplace flexibility, again, it, it leads, it's associated with a, a higher probability that low skill workers will be affected by this labor reducing automation. So we, we have here, we have a double whammy for low workplace flexibility. It's increasing the probability that autom automation will come in. And secondly, when it does, or if it does come in, uh, low skill workers are going to be affected. So that's my second chime. I'll just wrap up for the next 20 seconds or so. Flexibility at the onset of the pandemic, financial flexibility, is an important determinant of global planning. Investment flexibility has this conditional impact on workplace flexibility, on via workplace flexibility on investment. Workplace flexibility, very important for employment, uh, conditionally important for investment, turns out to be the, the binding margin at the onset of the pandemic. And to move on, you know, workplace flexibility is not, not only the binding margin at the onset, it's, it continues to be the, the, the important driver of firm decisions as the pandemic continues. It has influences on kind of the nature of investment as well as effects on in automation and that low workplace flexibility for firms automation is especially important and, and especially important and the displac displacement of low skill workers is much more likely okay uh, that's all thank you very much thank you and now we transition to the third paper uh, Fabrizio is going to present and the title is public guarantees for small businesses in Italy during COVID-19 Hi, hi, thank you very much everyone for having our paper. Uh, this is joint board with Filippo De Marco. Can you all see my slides? Yes, okay, wonderful. So um, in this paper, uh, we analyze the allocation of guaranteed credit during the COVID-19 crisis in Italy, looking at both the firm side, so demand, and the, um, the bank side, so supply. Uh, Italy, launched a massive program of guarantees worth up to 400 billion euros, which amount to roughly 57 uh, of 57% of lending to non-financial firms at the end of 2019, and is similar in size to the US PPP program. In particular, on the bank side, we're gonna explore the angle of banks IT. Why, why do we think this is relevant? Because in a context of severe mobility limitations and constrained labor force, the digital infrastructure is going to be likely to be important for the participation in terms of efficiency uh, and quantity for, of banks in the program. Uh, we focus on Italy because we have excellent loan level data for the universe of loans uh, with both firm and banks identifier. And the program also have unique institutional details like a free 100% guarantee on very small loans. Uh, let me give you a preview of our results. So at the firm level, we find that firms receiving the funds initially in April and May are more likely to be in areas that are more affected by the pandemics, both in terms of number of deaths and positive tests. They are more likely to be active in sectors that were deemed non-essential and shut down starting from late March. And they are more likely to be smaller with less cash, higher leverage and lower Z scores 
So there are more likely to be firms that are riskier and more fragile. But all these factors lose relevance over time as we move into the summer from June to August. And all types of firms receive um, government guaranteed funds. And the correlation with the force of the pandemic even turns negative from June onwards. On the bank side, on the other end, we find a strong bank heterogeneity in bank participation. We find that larger banks are more likely to issue these guaranteed loans, so participate into, into the program, and they also disburse these loans faster and charge lower rates. And this is important because one of the goals of the government was to get these funds quickly to SMEs. We are also going to find that above and beyond size, the quality of IT infrastructure matters. Banks with better IT uh, charge lower rates and these bourse loans faster. But we still find that the branch network matters, even in this context of lockdowns and constrained mobility, because we find that banks lend more in terms of guaranteed lending in their core markets and where they have a larger market share of local branches. We put forward several explanations for these, for these results. Uh, larger banks have lower funding costs. For example, they have easier access to SCB funding, and they have uh, a, lower, a lower average cost due to, due to high volumes of these guaranteed loans. And this is going to be important because the profit margins on this guaranteed lending is going to be extremely small. On the other end, better IT improves access to credit as loans applications were mainly filed online on banks' website and banks' mobile apps because of lockdown and branch closures. But even in this context, lending relationships are sticky and they still matter very much for the allocation of credit. Now, um, let me give you some more detail about how this program works. Um, so in normal times, uh, guarant public guarantees are partial up to 80% of the loan. And in order to access them, borrowers need to pay fees ranging from 25 to 200 basis points on top of the loan rate. Furthermore, their application for a guarantee need to be screened using a scoring system by the guarantee fund. Now, starting from April 8, 2020, the government introduced new rules. So the government helped the guarantee to 90% for all loans below 5 million euros and introduce a full 100% guarantee for loans up to 25,000 euros, a threshold later increased to 30,000 in June. For these very small loans, furthermore, there are no fees to be paid by the borrower. There is no credit check that the borrower has to undergo. And there is an interest rate ceiling formula to determine the interest rate that the banks can charge the borrower, which caps the interest rate to around 2%. The process is as follows. So the SME puts forward an application for a guaranteed loan to the bank. The bank approved the loan and can then start disbursing the loan and, 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 and put forward a second guarantee application to the guarantee fund, which then approves this guarantee. Now, let me talk about the data sources we use. Uh, we have uh, confidential loan level data with bank firm identifiers from the Italian SME Guarantee Fund. Uh, for every loan, we have the amount, the interest rate, the disbursement time, which we calculate as the number of days between the date in which the guarantee has been approved and the date in which the loan has been disbursed by the bank to the SME. Uh, and the main advantage that we have, for example, compared to uh, US PPP data, is that we're going to have the unique tax code of both firms and the bank issuing the loan. This means that we can match this loan level data to firm level and bank level balance sheet data from Orbis. And we're going to have balance sheet data also for a large sample of private firms in Italy from, from our Bureau Van Dyke Orbis. In terms of bank IT data, we hand collected information on mobile banking apps quality of Italian banks, namely their rating on Google Play Store. And this is going to be our proxy for the quality of the bank IT. We're also going to have uh, information about infections and deaths throughout the country from the Italian Statistical Institute. Our final sample consists of 650,000 mainly private firms with full financial accounts. 180,000 of these access the guarantees, and the other did not. This is going to represent, uh, for most of the paper, our control group. Now, here in this graph, you can see the explosion of guaranteed lending in Italy 
in the second half of 2020. So in 2019, um, on, average, on an average month, there were around 10,000 loans, originate, guaranteed loans originated with an average size of 150,000 euros. But from April to August 2020, the number of loan originated skyrocketed to 1 million in total over four months. 86% of these were below 25,000 euros. So this very small 100% guaranteed loan, which is why in our analysis, we keep these loans separate from the bigger 90% guaranteed loans. So here you can see the result in the first two columns for the 100% guaranteed loans, and in the second two columns for the loans um, guaranteed at 90%. And here the outcome is a dummy zero one on whether the firm access uh, got one of these loans and zero if it didn't. Uh, and as you can see, the firms that access these guaranteed loans are younger with less cash, higher leverage and lower Z scores. And um, <clears throat> so they tend to be more fragile. And in terms of um, the force of the pandemic, we find that more funds flow to affected areas early on, so in April and May, but this reverses after June. So from June onwards, all areas of the country see so the inflow of these guaranteed funds. Uh, and these firm level factors lose relevance over time. And we see that all types of firms, even safer firms, receive these guaranteed loans throughout the summer. Now on the bank side, on the other end, we find that larger banks charge lower rates. So here you have a scatter plot at the bank level in which you have on the y-axis, the average interest rate that the banks charge on these, on these guaranteed loans. And on the, uh, and on the x-axis, the log of the number of these loans issued by that bank. And as you, you can see, there is a clear negative correlation. Why? Well, for example, larger banks have access to the ECB TLTRO facility. They could get liquidity at minus 1% from the ACB and lend it at one, on an average 1% interest rate through this guaranteed uh, lending program with no or very little credit risk. So it seems like a very good deal for banks to participate, for larger banks to participate. In terms of IT, the quality of IT determines the efficiency in disbursement for these loans by banks. So here you can see in red, the distribution of disbursement times for banks were an up rated four stars or more. And in blue, the distribution of disbursement time for banks with the mobile banking app rated between one and three stars, so lower quality IT banks. And you can see that the mean of the red distribution is much smaller, meaning that these banks disburse loans, that higher quality IT banks disburse loans much faster. Here, important to notice also is that um, the average disbursement time for these loans is minus a week, meaning that banks were disbursing the lo these loans one week before uh, the approval of the guarantee from the guarantee fund. We can test this more formally in a, in a regression, controlling for all banks' uh, characteristics. Here, you, uh, here we, um, this is the regression for the 100% guaranteed loan. And as you can see, for disbursement times, um, banks with an app rated four stars or more, disburse this loan five days, uh, take five days less to disburse these loans on a average of, of, of on a cross-sectional average of seven days. So this is very economically meaningful. Um, also, we find that larger banks disburse these loans faster and they also charge lower rates. We don't find much going on on interest rate for banks IT for these 100% guaranteed loans because these loans uh, had a cap on interest rate. But if we focus on bigger loans guaranteed at 90% in which banks were free to determine the interest rate of market condition, here we can see that banks with better IT um, disburse these loans faster as the smaller loans, but they also charge lower rates. And this is true after controlling for size. So this is not due to bigger banks having better quality IT. But as I said in the beginning, we still find that the branch network matters. So here we collapse our data at the bank province pair, and we find that the bank is more likely to issue more of these guaranteed loans in provinces in which as a local, uh, as a higher local market share, which is the percent, the, the, the market power in terms of branches of the bank in, a, in that specific province. And also the bank 
a bank is more likely to lend more in a province that is more important for the bank portfolio. This is what core market share measures. And this is true after controlling for bank characteristics, but also this is robust to the inclusion of province and bank fixed effects. So exploiting only within province variation and within bank variation. So it, IT is extremely important in this context, but lending relationship are sticky even in these exceptional circumstances. And um, as my time, I believe is approaching to an end um, and I very much look forward to comments and, and suggestions. Uh, let me wrap up. So in this paper, we studied the public guarantee program introduced in Italy in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, on the demand side, on the firm side, we find that guaranteed loans went to more affected areas and sector and more fragile firms initially. And then later on, as the force of the pandemic diffused to the rest of the economy and to the rest of the country, all type of firms and all type of areas receive government guaranteed funds. But we find the supply side restriction matter and, and they are an important part of the story in terms of size. So found that their relationships with large banks obtain more loans faster and at a lower cost. The IT uh, infrastructure of banks matter a lot. So banks with a more efficient pre-existing IT infrastructure these force loans faster and charge lower rates. But even if IT matters, branches still do too. So banks lend more in their core markets and where they have a larger market share of local branches. And with this, uh, I conclude. So thank you very much. Thanks Fabrizio for being on time and actually ahead of time. So you only heard the tone once. So the, the fourth paper today is bank liquidity provision across the firm size distribution. Olivier is presenting. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for organizing and for everyone else. Um, this is joint work with Gabe Trudeau-Reich, Stefan Luke, and Matt Plosser. The last two are at the Fed, so the usual disclaimer apply. Uh, you know, I want to reinforce what Joran said. Actually, uh, Gabe is here, so if you have any question live, uh, don't hesitate to write in the Q and A. He'll be able to answer as we go through. So the focus of this paper is bank liquidity across the firm size distribution, and the starting point is really the idea that credit plays a dual role. So it can be used to finance long-term investment, but there's a second crucial role of banks, which is to provide liquidity to withstand cash flow shocks. So the most common way to do that is to have banks let their, the, their borrowers draw on credit lines that were set up in advance. Now, small firms, are especially reliant on this type of bank liquidity to avoid financial distress. And that's because they have much less alternative funding needs relative to big firms. So the big question that we're trying to answer is, do small firms face tighter access to bank funds than large firms? And needless to say, this was a question that was on the forefront of everyone's mind in 2020, where some observer went as far as saying that much of America was shut out of the greatest boring binge ever. So what we're gonna do in this paper is to use novel data to shed light on this question by providing evidence both from normal times and bad times. The data we're using comes from the Federal Reserve. It's the so-called Y14 data that includes all corporate loans with committed balances of a million dollar or more from bank holding companies with at least hundred billion dollar of assets. Now what's really nice about this data set is the population of firms that you can observe. It includes many SMEs in addition to large firm. We have over 60,000 SMEs that we define as firm with assets below $250 million, including 50,000 uh, small SMEs with asset below 50 million. And that's strikingly different from most commonly used data set in the US like CompuStat or DealScan. Now we can observe some loan terms like maturity, collateral, or interest rates, and credit utilization in a quarterly panel from 2015 to the middle of 2020. Now, this data actually covers a sizable share of the corporate credit market, about 60% of all US corporate loans. Now, while this data is really great, um, I wanna make clear that there are some limitations. In particular, we can't observe micro enterprises and very small loans 
we can't observe smaller banks and we don't see fee or covenant data. Of course, in the paper, we do the best we can to make convince ourselves that these limitations don't really change the main interpretation of our findings. Now, the first part of the paper is going to talk about differences in loan terms between small and big firms in normal times. So in particular, we want to highlight five facts about loan terms. First, related to maturity. SMEs have actually much shorter maturity credit line compared to larger firms. Small SM, the smallest SMEs, actually 30% of their loans are demandable, which means they're immediately potentially callable by the lender uh, which can ask for money back with essentially no restriction. So these are loans that essentially have zero maturity. And this is extremely rare for small, for larger firms. And these loans typically don't exist in the most common databases. Now, beyond demand loans, over 75% of loans to small SMEs have actually maturity of one year or less. That's, of course, a very different from larger firms. Maturity rises monotonically and sharply with firm size with the largest firm having a modal credit line maturity of about five years. Now, the second fact is related. These SMEs do not actively manage the maturity of this short-term credit line, which implies that they frequently have expiring credit. Essentially, most SMEs are just rolling over loan as they become due. That's very different from large firms. About 40% of the loans to the small SMEs are immediately callable or due in 2020 Q1. 85% or do sometime in 2020. For the largest firm, this is only about 10% of the loans are gonna be due within the calendar year. The third fact is about collateral. SMEs almost always pose some form of collateral where large firm often borrow unsecured. For small SMEs, they borrow unsecured less than 10% of the time. For credit line, they tend to pledge either account receivable or a blanket. On the other hand, 70% of the largest firm are borrowing on secure. The fourth fact is that in normal time, SMEs actually utilize these credit lines at a higher rate than large firms. So if you think about utilization rate, how much they borrow from their credit limit, you see that if you lose at firms that use a lot of their credit line, over 70% of what they have available, that's one third of SMEs, but it's only 7% of the largest firm. Vice versa, if you look at firms that use these credit lines very little with a utilization rate below 10%, it's one third of SMEs, but it's three quarters of the largest firm. Okay, and that's in spite of having stricter loan terms. Now, the fifth, fifth fact is related to loan pricing. SMEs actually end up paying higher spreads, even conditional and firm characteristic. And this gradient is not explained by bank or industry or market concentration or rating financials or how much they use the credit lines. It really seems like the firms, the small firms are not receiving benefits of lower spread in exchange for stricter loan terms. So these five facts together suggest that SMEs compared to larger, firm, larger firms are choosing loan terms from a different menu rather than choosing a different items from the same menu as large firms. Now, how should we think about these, uh, 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 these evidence from normal time and what are the implications for bad times? Okay, well, we want to argue that it's important to take an incomplete contracting perspective uh, on this issue. Okay? The five facts that we just saw basically indicates that SMEs have credit lines with loan terms that allow for more lender discretion. The lender has more lever they can, it can pull. For example, it can call a demand loan early, or it can decide not to roll over or short-term maturity credit line. It can also revalue a collateral at high frequency before deciding whether to grant fund or not. On the other hand, the loan terms for larger firms give them a lot more liquidity insurance. Now in the paper, we show that these can actually be rationalized uh, with an optimal incomplete contracting framework where SMEs have larger cash flow shocks and more uncertain assets. And in fact, we verify using our microdata that indeed SMEs are in the data more volatile and also much less likely to report reliable audited financials. Now, what are the implications? Well, the, uh, the idea is that contracts signed in good times are going to matter for bad times. And in particular, if firms sign different contracts, they're gonna have different access to liquidity in crisis. Specifically, small firm might not be able to draw 
after a large cash flow shock. So what we're going to do in the second part of the paper is look at what happened in 2020 and look at the access to bank liquidity uh, 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 during the shock in the cross section of firms. So let's start to look at that. So it's well known that in the aggregate CNI lending has risen sharply in the beginning of 2020. What our micro data allow us to do is to unpack where this rise comes from. And what we see strikingly is that almost all of it is driven by drawdown of large firms on their existing credit lines. Small firms have virtually no significant increase in drawn credit in that time. So you can see this here. Let me highlight a few numbers. Here you see that in, in the first quarter of 2020, there was a large increase in borrowing, but that there's essentially no difference for, small, for smaller firms. Almost all the difference is coming quantitatively from the larger firm. Now this panel here just uh, shows that the lion's share of this increase is coming from drawdown on pre-existing credit line facilities and not on new loan originated. And the last bit here is to show that there was a bit of reversal in the second quarter of 2020. And that is a reversal that happens even for the smaller firms, which didn't draw in the first quarter. And this is going to be related to the PPP intervention, something I'll come back at the end. Now, of course, an alternative explanation for this pattern is differential need for cash, okay, for funding. Maybe smaller firms are less exposed to the shock than bigger firms. Okay, so to see whether this difference in, is in, in funding needs can explain the difference in drawdown, we're going to do the following exercise. We're going to uh, construct an industry level measure of exposure to the shock by using employment decline. And what we see is the following striking fact. We find that if a firm face a larger shock, it's going to have higher drawdown, but only if it's a large firm, not if it's a small firm. So to see that, look at the right panel for large firm only. On the y, on the x axis, excuse me, we plot the abnormal, we're gonna sort industry according to abnormal decline in industry employment. And the industries here that are the most affected are exactly the one that you would expect, like clothing, accommodation, amusement, gambling, performing art, motion picture, and so on. And what we see is for large firm, if you're in a firm that is in a more affected sector, you're going to have a larger drawdown on your credit line. That's exactly what you expect. That's what these credit lines are for. However, for smaller firm, you see that this pattern doesn't hold. Even for firm in industry that are more exposed, you do not see a significantly larger drawdown. Okay. In the paper, of course, we argue that this pattern is robust to a, a number of things including using occupational physical proximity as an instrument uh, for industry exposure. Okay, our reading of the survey evidence is also that demand for funds was high for both small and large firm during this period. Now, these findings suggest that there's potentially a role for public intervention to improve SME's access to liquidity during this time. And that's exactly what the PPP or the Paycheck Protection Program set out to do, right? It provided some term loan with relatively long maturity, relatively low interest rates, and didn't ask for any collateral. So this was, of course, targeted towards the smallest firm, with some exception. And importantly, it was forgivable if enough of the funds were used to cover payroll. Now, what we do is we matched the public filings of PPP borrow with our Y14 data to see a picture of what firms are doing with these funds. And what we see is actually pretty striking we find that the vast majority of PPP funds to Y14 borrowers are used to repay credit line balances. Okay, it's very clear that PPP recipients have a much higher repayment propensity in the second quarter of 2020 relative to firms that did not receive PPP. Well, quantitatively, this is quite large, in fact. If you think about how much of the PPP funds received by a firm went back to their bank, for the smallest SME, that's about 72%. For larger SME, it's over 100%, and pooled across all the firms that we have in our sample, it's 95%. Now let me conclude. So the first part of the evidence is about normal time, where uh, we show that SME sign loan contracts that give significant discretion to lender over granting funds. Now that matters for bad times. When large cash flow shock arrives, such as COVID, 
the dry powder that these firms have on paper might overestimate what is actually available for them. And that's true, importantly, even if banks' balance sheets are strong. So it's qualitatively different from the credit crunch of the last financial crisis. Now, what does it mean? Well, the punchline is that contracting frictions are a key driver for financial constraint and cyclicality of credit in the cross-section of firm, if you want to compare small and large firms. Our evidence suggests that it's useful to go beyond the simple credit demand versus credit supply dichotomy. And that's because credit lines are not a normal good. They are an incomplete contract with contingent allocation of control rights. So this has a lot of implication. For example, one clear policy implication is that it's unlikely to be enough to just bolster bank balance sheet. Okay? In fact, it's, it's a very challenging policy question of how alleviate uh, uh, this differential access to liquidity in bad times. And you know, what is needed is, is just more work that combines kind of precise microdata with an economic perspective of what's the underlying friction. And the hope is that this paper is, is a step in this direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivier. You are also ahead of time. And with that, uh, we have the final paper of this session. How do depositors respond to COVID-19? And Ross is presenting. So this paper actually follows very nicely from, from the last one. And given a referee report we, we had, I wish we had, I wish I had known about the, the, the last paper earlier. So this paper is joint with Chen Lin and Ming Zhu and Wen Zhi. Um, uh, Chen is at Hong Kong University and Ming Zhu is at Hong Kong and Wen Zhi is a Chinese university. Um, so the purpose of this of our research is very simple. It's uh, we want to understand uh, why U.S. bank deposits surged uh, quite a bit, about two trillion dollars during the initial months of the pandemic. Um, and we offer new empirical evidence about uh, some different explanations for why this might have happened. Our focus is going to be quite granular. We're going to use weekly data and we're going to focus on individual bank branches uh, across counties in the, in the US. Now there's a, a couple of explanations and just to as a, as a preview, we're not going to um, nail down one. In particular, we're going to suggest that some have less explanatory power, but let me go through some of the major explanations. So one is a simple precautionary savings view that um, local COVID cases uh, trigger concerns about the local economy. And so uh, people get nervous and they want to increase their savings. And some of that savings flows into, into bank deposits. Um, this gives some predictions about local deposit rates, that local deposit rates, given this increase in supply, should go down. And this precautionary savings view also suggests that local savings um, should go up or local spending should go down. Now, past work on precautionary savings has given, given fairly mixed results. And the, the, but we're going to, but most, a, a lot of that has been done in the context of financial crises. Um, and we're going to focus on a, a particular type of crisis, a COVID crisis which I think made people very nervous about unemployment, losing their jobs and, and financial security. So we'll, we'll see how that works, how those predictions bear out in, in, in this context. Another view that received lots of attention is flight to safety. So there's an adverse financial stock and people wanna to reallocate to, uh, to, to safer savings vehicles, bank deposits perhaps being one of them. Now, now this view is, is sort of an aggregate view in, in the sense that it's, you know, people have money in the stock market, in the bond market, in, in international markets, and then there's a reallocation. Um, it's, it's not necessarily a prediction about what goes on at the county branch level. Um, so this prediction also predicts a decrease in deposit rates, um, but one has to augment the typical flight to safety view. We call this the localized flight to safety corollary so that a, a local shock, what's going on in a county might generate greater pessimistic fears about the local economy. And so that there's a reallocation um, that's different at the county level, which, which, which could be, and we're going to uh, assess that. Now the flight to safety view has primarily been examined in the context of financial crises 
and we're going to examine it in the context of the of the of the COVID, the, the COVID crisis. Um, another view, um, which has received quite a bit of, of research and for which there's there's support in different contexts, is a demand for deposits. So as firms draw down their credit lines with banks, um, they have to increase their deposit rates in order to attract deposits in order to fund those loans. So this obviously gives a prediction that local deposit rates will tend to increase in response to the county level cases. And there's, there's support for, for this view. And uh, most recently, Lee, you know, Lee et al. Uh, showed that there's a drawdown in credit lines and the last paper sort of you know, got into this. Um, and we're not gonna look at credit lines uh, because other people have, have done that. We're gonna examine what happened with deposits. Now kind of over uh, an overarching issue in all of this is that the you know, expansionary monetary policies or expansionary fiscal policies can account for this. And there's evidence along these lines too that um, you know, PPP loans and, and bank lending may all be affected by what's going on at the policy front. And so we're going to certainly not rule it out. Our main thing is to assess whether these types of policy interventions fully account for what's going on in deposit markets. So the baseline specification that we're going to use is, is quite simple. We're going to look at deposit rates at the, at the branch level um, within a county and in a, in a week. And we're going to look at COVID cases, uh, the cumulative COVID, COVID cases as of the last week. And um, in this specification, uh, we're going to control for many fixed effects. We're going to have uh, a fixed like effect for the, for the branch, uh, for state week and for bank week. And then we're gonna have it for the, uh, the day of the week on which sort of deposit rates uh, are, are calculated. So that, that's, that's, that's what we're gonna do. We, the deposit rate we use is gonna be on a 12 month CD, but we've done this for different types of, of deposit rates, get similar results. Um, and so obviously with including the, the bank week fixed effects, we're gonna be comparing interest rates between two branches of the same bank when we include those. So this sort of um, uh, addresses many potential confounding effects. So uh, this is sort of the, the, if we just focus on the columns one and two for now as the baseline results, um, you can sort of see, you can see a negative relationship between the incidence of COVID cases and uh, deposit rates. And so again, this is comparing deposit rates at two branches of the, of the same bank. Um, and in, in column two, in column one, we have a much larger sample, of course, without those fixed effects, and we control for a variety of uh, bank characteristics. And, and the results are, are similar, but the, the estimated coefficient falls about half when controlling for the, um, the bank week fixed effects, which, which makes sense. Um, and as you can see, the, the estimate is, is, is pretty large as you get a 2.2 um, a basis point decline in deposit rates. So now why don't we um, start with uh, Q&A um, and if Ross comes back, we will switch back to his presentation. Any questions from the audience? If you have any questions, you can uh, notify us by the Q&A box or you can raise your hand. Okay, so uh, then I will ask a question to Olivia and Gabe uh, for the patterns that you show, which is super interesting, how the drawdowns line up with the, um, uh, the extent to which firms are affected in different industries for large and small firms. Did that pattern change after the Fed's intervention in the bond market and a lot of the large firms started issuing bonds to uh, repay their credit lines? What, um, what time point was the uh, figure that you showed just now. I, I can answer that. Um, so we show first quarter uh, of 2020. Uh, you could extend to two. It look it looks relatively similar. Um, actually, whether you go three months out or six months out. Um, we, we do in the paper, of course, a lot of things to try to control for, for example, the bond market intervention. It actually doesn't change things very much uh, at, at all. Um, you know, it is true that a lot of uh, of, uh, of bond issuers repaid um, uh, after they issued bond, but the truth is, there's also a lot of bond issuers that didn't draw on their credit line at all at any point. And so, Q1 
quantitatively in our big sample that has both small, middle, and large firms, the bond market access kind of indicator doesn't really do much to change anything meaningfully. And that's true, not just of this figure, but in fact of, of many results, something that we didn't necessarily anticipate, but it just seems to be true in, in the data. Yeah, my view is that the bond market intervention, I think had very, very, um, narrow effect on bond issuers themselves. And that's actually a, a relatively small sample of firms uh, compared to you know the, 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 the dozens of thousands that we have in our sample. Very targeted I, effect. I, I remember that if you draw a time series plot of credit line drawdowns for net credit line drawdowns, for example, since the beginning of the year, you can see the, credit, the bond market interventions footprint pretty visibly. But it seems um, what you uh, explained is that in the cross section, most of the patterns that you show stay regardless of, of the bond issuance. Right, so it's, there's definitely a reversal towards the Q2, but what we can see in our MITRE data rather than just the aggregate time series is that the reversal is pronounced for a lot of firms, including some without bond market access, uh, including even very small firms that it didn't even draw in Q1. So we think the reversal goes beyond the specific intervention. That's the nice thing about having this very detailed panel. Um, that certainly helps to, to see whether that was going on. We think there, there is a lot more than that. Uh, Question for you guys, uh, same, same paper. So what I saw a lot of is a banks offering firms not to draw down the credit lines, but instead offering another facility. And uh, so any, uh, any way you know, this affects your paper, can you are able to see a brand new facility being offered in lieu of not drawing down on the existing credit lines? Yes, we can, as long as it's within one of the banks of our sample, of course. Um, um, so within existing relationship, yes. Quantively, it is about maybe 20% of the aggregate increase, something like that, that the maximum comes from new origination of typically term loans. Um, so we haven't studied in, in detail the margin of why you would draw down rather to obtain a term loan. I think that's a very interesting question. That's not something we have addressed, but for sure credit lines draw down is the lion's share of the origination. We also interestingly didn't see a drop in origination of new loans actually, or cancellation of existing loans, something we thought would be much more prevalent. This didn't seem to have happened at least in the first six months. Uh, it might happen later, we will see, but um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, the extensive margin was definitely much less of a factor of driving the credit uh, flows rather than you know, draw down at the intensive margin of existing facility. That's what we can see. Thank you. It seems that Ross is back, so we'll continue with his presentation, and I will restart the clock after he gets set up. Yes, so the, the finding here is that um, as COVID cases increased in a county, um, branch deposit rates fell. And then a sort of a natural question is, you know, is this driven by national policies? And so despite state weak effects, which are going to account for um, overall, overall changes that are, that are taking place either at the national or at the state level, there might be policies that differentially affect counties that are more or less affected by COVID. So for example, the CARES Act might have an effect on particularly affected counties. And so, and that could account for the surge so we do in that context as we look at what happened before the passage of the CARES Act, and then we can also take account of, of PPP loans. And so accounting for that doesn't seem to have uh, much of an effect on, on the results. And if anything, the effects are stronger before the CARES Act, which would be fairly consistent with the first two explanations of either just a, a flight to safety or precautionary savings where people are especially nervous about their economic futures before sort of policy actions take place. Um, and so that, that's what you can see in columns three and four and controlling for the PPP loans doesn't seem to have um, much of an effect at all on the relationship between um, the COVID cases and local deposit rates, which is not an argument that the PPP loans don't affect deposits, nor is it an, an argument that the CARES Act doesn't affect deposits, just that um, there's something else going on that, that doesn't fully affect the results, that the, the findings that we have. 
That's kind of a question, well, what about savings per se? We look at, at deposit rates because that provides uh, some information about uh, what's going on in, in these local markets, but what about savings per se? Um, the issue here is that we face some data limitations in that we have deposit rates at a weekly branch level and for consumer spending, we're going to have to move to a county week level. And so what you can see here is that uh, uh, the, the dependent variable in this case is going to be consumer spending at the, um, at the county week level. And then we're gonna have cases at the, at the county week level kind of lagged. And we're gonna still, we can, in this case, we can control for state weeks effects. We obviously can't control for examination at the branch level because we're not examining branches. Um, but here you see evidence consistent with a drop in uh, a, a drop in spending and increase in savings. It's been documented by others. We're doing it at this at this county level aligned with the work on deposit rates. And so this is very consistent with the precautionary savings view. The other issue is what about deposits? While people have documented what has gone on in in, in deposits, certainly at the aggregate level. We can look at this at the at the county level and link this up with the with the COVID rate with the uh, with the COVID data. Again, we don't have this at the at the brand, at we don't have this at the same level of granularity as we do some of the um, some some at, uh, for for some of the other evidence. But we can we do have this evidence at the at the bank county level. We can look at quantities at the bank county level. So what we do in this case is we look at deposits and we, we, look, at the, we look at cases. And here we have this um, not at the weekly level, we have this over a longer period of time. So we can look at the growth in the, in the deposit rates from June to June, um, just in, in order to confirm about what's going on in terms of deposits with COVID. And so the results there also sort of are consistent with um, um, a variety of explanations, but you do see that deposits go up. There is an increase in, in quantities along with uh, the increase in, in COVID exposure. Um, we do a variety of heterogeneous tests. The, the focus here is to see um, is the response in terms of deposit rates, is this more responsive during periods, time periods, and in counties where people are likely to be more sensitive to news about their economic futures? So if this is a precautionary savings story, if this is a, a localized flight to safety story, then we should see that when you hit uh, individuals in a county with a similar COVID shock, are they more likely to increase their deposits and hence see a reduction in deposit rates more during times when they're going to be more nervous or in counties, counties where they're likely to be more nervous about their economic futures. So in terms of time periods, we look at periods of stock market volatility or when it's performing poorly. And then in looking at counties that might be more sensitive to shocks, we draw on um, research that's been done, we look at things like, you know, is it a more democratic county, which tended to be uh, research those have been more sensitive to news about COVID for reasons I don't understand, um, or counties with older populations. Uh, being an older person, that's something I do understand. Counties with more educated populations might be more aware of what's, of what's going on and the risks. And counties with less social capital, the issue here is that in counties where there's greater bonds um, there may be less anxiety about, about the future, and there's been some research uh, supporting that, not in the context of the deposits, but in the context of, of, of other things. And so these tests provide additional assessments. And we find very consistent evidence for this view that during periods when people are going to be more sensitive to news about their economic futures or in counties that for Due to past research, we suggest people are going to be more sensitive to uh, news about COVID and, and kind of how that's going to create pessimism about their economic futures and hence lead to more deposits. We find evidence uh, sort of consistent with those. And th this holds even when you can look at these individually, but here for the summary, you can see that these are not simply capturing the same feature about sensitivity to news that they enter independently when, when it can be included simultaneously. 
So, so, so just two summary slides, one on findings and one on sort of maybe inferences. So on findings, as the deposit rates at bank branches in counties with higher infection rates fell by more um, uh, across branches within the same bank. Um, and macroeconomic policies don't seem to account for this. Uh, consumer spending falls by more uh, in counties with higher infection rates and deposits increase by more in those, in those same types of counties. And this negative relationship seems to be greater in places where a priori you might expect there, that these COVID shocks are going to create more anxiety about people's economic futures. So as for the precautionary savings view, it, it accounts for the increase in deposits and accounts for the decrease in deposit rates and the decrease in spending. So much of the findings are consistent with this view. Um, and precautionary savings is not inconsistent with an increase in lending. Um, the localized flight to safety, um, it, it also accounts for the increase in deposits and the decrease in deposit rates. And it's not increased with the results on spending and, and lending. The demand for deposit view, while this may this force may be at play, it alone is sort of inconsistent with the deposit rate decrease. And the policy view is consistent with everything, um, but it doesn't fully account for the findings. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And now we will go to the Q&A session. Um, I, we have roughly 27 minutes uh, which is five-ish minutes for each paper. And um, if you have any questions, please raise hand uh, or for panelists, please unmute. There is one question. Ross has a question. Please go ahead. Okay, so I had a question on the, um, I, I had a question for, the, for, for, for John Barry, the, the, the collection of authors there, and this was about, um, is it feasible, and, and this is maybe not directly related to this paper, but is it feasible to know a priori, could you have predicted in January, which firms within an industry would be uh, more flexible in terms of operational flexibility, workplace flexibility? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that, but co-authors speak up. In some sense, yes. Now we have the benefit of having seen what happened in shock, in uh, COVID shock, but the way we measure operational one is with an industry-based work from home measure. And that was well established before the crisis hit. And we've tried to validate that within our sample, but the, our measure was established beforehand. And secondly, um, for the investment flexibility, we actually asked that question one year ago, in, well, by now a year and a half ago, in March of 2019. And we asked the firms basically, can you, how flexible is the speed at which you can invest? Can you speed it up and slow it down or maybe never finish? And we took that, we got a lot of responses from that, I think 500 or so, and we put it to an industry level. So we actually used that on an industry level also. And so yes, we, we we had those variables before we started conducting the March of 2019 survey, if that sort of answers the question. Uh, I, sorry, I don't wanna like hold the floor too long, but let me just say one other thing, uh, Harrison and I were chatting about that. Um, so we have these kind of day by day uh, responses on how the, um, as firms respond as uh, COVID-19 was hitting the United States. And you can see in our case, right around mid-March, you know, the bottom fell out. And uh, we went and we, we have forecasts of employment, capital spending, revenues, and a number of other things. So we compared that, those forecasts to the IBIS forecasts for revenues in our case is what we really were focusing on, not earnings like Harrison and, and Neng's paper. But we, um, it, they line up remarkably well. You know, they're almost on top of each other. So in other words, if you worry at all about CFO survey forecast for some reason, here we have the analysts lining up super nicely and the timing of when things fell and how much it fell. And if you want to take it from Harrison's perspective, you know that you could say, oh, well, it's just analysts, what do they know? But that we're, you know, we can tell you that, that the IBIS numbers line up nicely with the internal forecast of CFOs. So that seemed to be a nice external kind of uh, corroboration of the data we were using. 
Olivia? Uh, you need to unmute. Sorry. Yes, I have two short questions, if that's okay. One for Fabrizio and one for Ross. For Fabrizio, it's just, and I know for both of you, it's, you know, you're probably gonna have to speculate a little bit, but that's okay. So Fabrizio, what about like quote unquote zombie lending in Italy and how does the program matter for that? Just some thoughts on this would be interesting to hear. And for Ross, is there a sense in which we feel that there was some sort of match of deposit flow with bank that actually needed to lend more? You know, not just active in area, but actually that there was a matching in increased savings in places where there's actually banks were actually lending. Thanks. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, thank you very much Olivia, for the question. Um, so um, <clears throat> yes, so of course, uh, zombie lending um, may be, you know, maybe a problem, especially for these guaranteed loans, even if technically, in order to access these loans, you need not to be in a state of default or distress. So, but you know, uh, there are ways around that, of course. Uh, problem being so far, we don't, uh, so we don't observe, uh, let's say non-guaranteed lending by firms because we don't have a credit registry. So we can't really properly access the status of zombie or not. But at least on paper, all the firms that we analyze are in non-distressed state. Let's say. If I, if I may just add one one quick thing. Um, so it is difficult here, I think, in particular, to define a zombie firm in this context because one of the key definitions of of a zombie firm is receiving subsidized credit despite. Sorry, I mean, sorry, receiving a, a, a um, paying any an interest rate below prime, right, or or even very close to prime even if you are objectively speaking a bad firm, right? Looking at your balance sheet. Now, by definition, all the guaranteed credit is subsidized. So this is all below prime rate. Uh, so, you know, with this data is very difficult to, to talk, but, but you know, it, it is clearly the big concern with this, with this type of program. And we also don't know yet anything about defaults because by law uh, now in Italy, a firm cannot default yet. So because they, they close the bankruptcy courts we'll see that in the next six months. Um, what happens to that? Uh, so, yeah, so there's the, so one of the things I found, in, so one potential interpretational concern that we have uh, and that you might have with our results is that, is this reflecting something on the household level or our firms just drawing down lines of credit and depositing it in the bank. And that is sort of accounting for what we're finding. Um, so there's, there's two pieces of information. One was the, uh, the one of the things was that in the, the nice paper that uh, Olivier presented in, in terms of for, for our narrow purposes is that it suggests that this is not happening for small firms. And since our examination is a very local level it's unlikely that sort of COVID cases in New York are causing sort of um, you know, major firms to draw down their credit lines and deposit it in banks with, that just happen to be affected in local locales. So this was sort of, um, when listening, this was very informative to us. And the other thing that we've been doing, and this is super preliminary, is sort of, sort of examining deposit flows and drawdowns of credit at the bank level, we can't do it at the at the at, at the branch level, and there we we see we 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 see this surge in deposits that's much greater than any increase in drawing down of lines of credit in the affected areas. So we we don't think it's only that that channel. There is an audience question from Jeff Rosen. I think you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the going back to the workplace flexibility question, there was a survey, I guess that was a national survey used. A lot of the time back then, people may have had the ability but didn't actually work from home. How would that skew the results? So uh, I'll take that one. And, um, so in our paper, we, we, we required that to have workplace flexibility that the workers said that they could work from home and they actually did work from home. 
We also kind of checked some of our main results just using the could have the ability to work from home and then they're very similar. So it's, it's not really securing results uh, in that respect. And we also uh, use the Dingle and Neiman measure kind of as a robustness check throughout the paper. I mean, it doesn't addre directly address your uh, question, but it aligns up. Um, so we've hit it from several different angles and it seems to, to hold up. Thanks. There are a few other questions from uh, the audience, I think. Ross, did you have another question? Uh, you do, but if you have somebody else can go first. But Mike, I'll just quickly, is this just, I'm so curious about the, the results in Fabrizio about all of the, um, uh, the, 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 the guaranteed loans. Have you ever have you done sort of a back of the envelope calculations? What are the what are the fiscal costs likely to be? So if you were to look at default rates on similar type loans in the past, um, given these guarantees, I mean, what is this going to have? What is what is going to be sort of the budgetary impact? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, um, of course, this is this is a concern. So so far, in terms of like uh, the targeted magnitude of the program that the government had in mind, take up has been fairly low. Let's say around seventeen percent of firms uh, uh, asked for for these loans. But uh, of course, these guaranteed lending uh, is deemed to be less, let's say, um, costly compared to direct subsidies because you still are, you know, acting through the bank system. So there is still the incentive uh, for, for the bank to recover the loans if, if things go sour and such. But of course, we, um, the problem is it's difficult. Uh, so most of these loans are very small. So 25,000 euros um loans so it's very hard to find comparable measures like you know uh of norm of like let's say normal times default of comparable loans it's it's really an unprecedented type of of, of loan that has been mostly issued under this program and and plus as filippo was my, my, as filippo was saying um we still don't know what is the real impact on, on firms because we can't observe any foreclosure or distress. Uh, so, but, but eventually this is something that it's gonna be extremely interesting and extremely important to, to understand. Thank you. I think there is a Q and A question for Ross. I see. Um, so we primarily, we primarily control for PPP loans and other elements of the CARES Act in order to examine uh, other ex potential explanations for the surge in deposits. This paper by Lee and Strawn that talk about the efficacy of the PPP loan uh, result. So I would say that the, the findings that we present don't um, are, 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 are robust to controlling for the PPP loans. That, that, that's not what's accounting for our, our findings. But at the same time, that's not to say that those loans did not have an effect on, on banking and lending. Thank you. Any questions for the first paper for Harrison? I have a quick question, uh, which you may have mentioned. Um, so conditional on the vaccine, what's people's expectation of how much this will help the industries that are most affected, like restaurants and um, air travel and so on? So, so we had a little bit on heterogeneity. Um, you know, I think if you estimate the model um, and you you know, there's that model kind of estimated full sample, and then you can kind of estimate the model for the, uh, for, you know, any one of these measures of these highly affected industries. Um, we, we were actually, you know, 
it didn't turn out. I mean, the model, I, we were thinking going in that there would be more heterogeneity for, for a few reasons. I think one was, you know, there's a lot of speculation that with the vaccine rollout, that certain industries would get it first. Right? There's a lot of political lobbying right now for who's going to get the vaccine first, right? Um, so, so that would kind of show up in, in a very different vaccine arrival rate, right? When, when you know, because basically in the model, uh, the, the, the arrival is really when, the, when that industry goes back to normal, right? Which, you know, of course, from the time a vaccine arrives. So I think it seems like when the expectations of all these guys, they're kind of basically uh, are pretty good about the timeline of a vaccine being approved, a timeline for some distribution but I think for sure there, there's still some uncertainty on the rollout that, that, that I think the, the estimates are kind of not picking up, which I think the CFOs seem to be doing a little bit better job of compared to the analysts. I think, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think this, this is not gonna be like super statistically significant because we're, we're not talking about why, why differences, but, but, but still I think uh, um, potentially economic meaningful. But when we estimated the model, it just didn't turn out that, that when we looked at these kind of highly levered industries or these high face-to-face -face industries, um, you know, the, the point estimates, certainly for the vaccine arrival rate, uh, seemed identical. Uh, there, there was a little bit more of an impact, obviously. So, I mean, I think kind of what we conclude is that these industries are not getting a vaccine earlier, right? Uh, but, you know, in the interim, they're definitely suffering more. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of reflected in the other two parameters. There's a bigger jump parameter for these guys, and, and, and there's a uh, 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 a lower point estimate for the, uh, for the for the growth rate for the differential between the pandemic and the non-pandemic growth rate, but but again, you know it was not it, you know we didn't kind of emphasize it mostly because I think with these nonlinear models I mean there's sort of two issues in the nonlinear models doing these types of uh, the point estimates when you just get down to small samples it becomes much harder right uh, uh, even if you can have a big point estimate you're still you're going to get much wider standard error band so so we can't really um, I think the only thing we could say is that it doesn't seem as if they're going to get a, a vaccine earlier, right? So the vaccine's not benefiting them earlier. Yeah, so I was also curious, so conditional on having the vaccine, what's the revenue impact or what's the earnings impact of the vaccine for these yeah. industries and what's the path of recovery? That people, yeah, that's, that's uh, a good question. So we, this is, this is sort of the, the, we did not, so in the model, to keep it parsimonious, right? To keep it at three three parameters, we we we're assuming that the initial jump is the reflation when the vaccine arrives. So that the, the functional form is a constrained model that says that when the vaccine arrives, you're going to get this this jump back up. Yeah, and that's why I was sort of saying earlier that. Um, we wanted to see if that model also fit 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 these industries. Uh, you know, I mean, it seemed like what the model is telling you is that yeah, you know, it will, but you got to make make these guys kind of jump down more, which could be coming from one of two sources. It could be coming from the initial jump down, or it could be coming from the anticipated reflation, right? So we were not we're not able to kind of separate uh, uh, these 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 two things. So it's the the model itself, even what I call the unconstrained model. Has, has, has constrained um, in that sense. So we're, we're thinking about how to kind of split up uh, these, these, these two effects, um, but, but, but we don't have any kind of great answers at this point, uh, just, just from the point of kind of the, the parsimony of the model. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. We have roughly 10 minutes left. Any other questions? I have a question for um, Olivier. Um, so I was wondering whether you checked uh, whether the patterns that you find for small and large firms can also be explained by the banks that are lending to these firms. So whether there are, you know, differences in, um, you know, for, 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 for some reason, maybe small banks are not willing to lend long term to small firms, but instead they do lend uh, long term to large firms. So whether, you know, this pattern will kind of survive a bank fix effect, if you, if you wish. Yeah, that's a great question, of course, and something we're very interested about. Uh, so, yeah, of course, because we have really loan level data, we obviously have bank quarter fixed effect like everywhere. And so we could do the differences within bank. We do a little bit of direct uh, bank heterogeneity question as well, especially respect to the shock. There's a lot of hypotheses related to 
you know, bank size, but also, you know, how uh, strong their balance sheet is. So, you know, we, we don't have small, small banks in our data, but we have regional banks that are still like, you know, orders of magnitude smaller than the, the very big ones. We repeat everything for them and we just find similar pattern. We just don't think that these key things are really driven by a bank business model, um, at least for the one that we can observe. And then Rick, in terms of, of uh, bank balance sheet strength, like capital ratio, liquidity ratio, deposit funding, similar to some earlier work by Phil Strahan uh, that, that predates the work a little bit. We don't think that this is a, it doesn't seem to be a big explanation of differential credit access. Um, so we, we think it's going beyond beyond banks here, at least within uh, what we can observe. And we, we think this is an, an interesting result. It's, it's not a given. I have a question for the paper Ross presented. Um, so you find that consumption uh, spending drops in more, right, in counties with higher COVID infection. I wonder if it's possible at all to separate the two possible mechanisms. One is, of course, what you promote, the precaution savings motive. It's riskier, people will save more, they spend less. The alternative is maybe uh, stronger restrictions imposed by the government. So you have fewer consumption opportunities. Uh, that's not quite the same story, right? So to the extent, uh, I wonder if you can tease these two out because, you know, people still tell stories like, you know, guys get locked in, you know, home and there's nothing they can do and so on. So, so can you shed some lights on some possible differentiation between the two possible mechanisms? Yeah, so the... So many, not many, not all of the restrictions are done at the at the state level. So in all of the analyses, we have state weak effects. So for this to be at the driven, for the spending results to be driven by restrictions, you know, you'd have to be differentiating by counties within a state. Um, possible, but a, a little bit more challenging. Um, and then we use that as a mechanism to say that, look, that's consistent with the precautionary savings motive and we're, gonna, we're focusing on the deposit rate data where there we can compare you know, branches of the, of the same bank. But I think that that's the best that I can, that's the best answer that I can do right now. Any possibility to look at online consumption versus offline consumption? Is that a possibility? Because presumably online, there's no restriction or the equal restriction. Is there any so, goods you can get by purchasing online versus goods you cannot get? It's, um, it, so part of this will reflect issues of data availability that I don't know off the top of my head. So the data we have that at a weekly basis is, is I think, online purchases. Um, and, and that's easy to then get at a, at a local level to compare it to um, to compare it to these other features, to, to compare it to other types of purchases, um, I, I have to we have to see what whether that data exists at that level, at that frequency. Have you looked at, for example, richer versus poorer countries? One intuition building off of Nung's question is, for poorer country, the poorer counties, sorry, the poorer counties may have stronger precautionary saving necessity, and the richer countries. May uh, the richer counties may otherwise spend a lot more on restaurants and so on, and then when you restrict their consumption, they will whatever paychecks they get goes to the bank. Yeah, given how much cross-country work I've done, I have the same issue with county and country. Um, so, um, so in in our analysis, since we're we typically have the branch fixed effects, um, we're going to kind of wash out the those type of county level effects. Um, now, what you're saying is that maybe it's worthwhile examining the differential impact right. ac across those counties, which is something we could do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. Okay, we only have four minutes left before we're supposed to get cut off. Um, for the audience, I would like to remind you that there is another COVID special session tomorrow at 12.15 uh, p.m. Eastern time on uh, asset pricing and macro finance. As, again, five papers uh, with the same format that we did today and hope that will be interesting and useful 
for you as well. So, well, um, thank you to all the presenters for really interesting papers and presentations. And thanks to everyone who attended the session, especially for those uh, uh, in California and the West Coast where it's super early in the morning and for those in Asia when it's really late at night. And thanks for your interest. And if you have additional questions, feel free to contact uh, the authors offline as well.